Welcome to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. The key to getting the most out of the seminar series is to listen to the small things, the subtle adjustments our faculty teams adhere to when the fishing might be tough or they're trying to target trophy game fish. That's what we call the gold nuggets of the seminar series. So come with me, let's get right to it and join, in progress, the Saltwater Sports and the National Seminar Series. Coming to you from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it's the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Now, here's George Poveromo. Welcome to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, filmed on location at the International Game Fish Association and brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. We're going to jump into a Florida Keys session on yellowtailing. Again, a very distinguished panel. I'm honored to share the set with you. We'll start off with Captain Diego Toyran from the Lower Florida Keys and Key West and also the host of the television series Pescandos and Los Cayos, which means fishing in the Florida Keys. Am I correct? You got it. Absolutely hit that one. I drill. I'm time. happy. <laughs> and, and right next to him, Captain Mark Schmidt, a longtime friend, noted light tackle guide out of Key West. Then I like to call him the pride of Marathon in the Florida Keys because he's on top of all the fish in that area there, the one, the only Captain Jimmy Gagliardini from High Caliber Fishing Charters. All right, to sort of gel this thing together, so many people come to the Florida Keys to target yellowtail. It's a very frustrating fish and that people see, well, they could get hundreds behind the boat, but yet they're so hard to catch. And, and a lot of people just get confused over it. So we're gonna go ahead and try to boil this down to make people who are just you know, on the cusp of really mastering the art of yellowtail and make them better anglers and make these trips successful. First off, let's talk about the location. You know, people want to, well, where do you go? Do you patch reef for them? Do you go near wrecks? Do you go on reefs? And I'm going to throw this out just to play devil's advocate. In the years that I've been yellowtailing, be it in the Florida Keys, be it in the Bahamas, my magical number has always been 75. If I could get my anchor to hold, and I'm sitting in a depth between 72 feet of water to 76, 77 feet of water. I know for the most part, given a good current, I'm going to score well. That seems to be the magical zone. And again, I'm throwing it out there for debate. I'll start off with you, Jimmy. When you're trying to find reefs and, and you're looking in the marathon area there, uh, do tails tend to get very strong at 50 to 60? Do they tend to get very strong out to 120? What, is there a magical zone? What are we looking for? Well, where, where, I, uh, where the area that I fish off marathon, a lot of it is that break, that break in the reef is 60 to 80, 90 feet of water. So you're, you're correct on that number because a lot of the fishing that we're doing is, is right there, 70, 80 feet. And, uh, and even deeper, we'll even get out there in 90 and 100 feet. Uh, but the majority of it, 60 to, 80, 60 to 80 feet of water. Is there a certain type, uh, I know it's the reef, is there a certain type of uh, bottom contour that you're looking or a break or anything that's going to determine, well, these spots here are going to be a lot better than, say, going down the reef line and, and looking at that same zone. Is there anything particular that you're looking for in that belt that's going to tell you this is where these tails are going to be? Generally, it's going to be in that break in the bottom. But, you know, for some reason, a lot of times, they'll be on one, one piece of bottom that is very similar to every, every piece of bottom around it. And, uh, and they'll be hanging around one particular uh, piece of bottom that really doesn't look any different than than other areas. So you have to experiment. You have to go and and, and try different areas. What's the rhyme or reason for that? I, I'm sure it has to do with the food source because mm -hmm. that's what the fish are always going to congregate around is, is some sort of you know some food source in that area. Gotcha, Diego. Uh, down your way to it, 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 you you cut your teeth commercial yellowtail fishing. You know you made a living on it for uh, quite some time too. As far as locating the fish, what could you tell us that we haven't discussed right now? And then what else could you add in terms of the right conditions, be it current or what? Well, down in the lower keys where we, where um, Mark and I fish, the east and, um, east and west currents are our best currents. On the summertime, 72, 80 feet of water. You know, you could even go down to 60, 62 feet of water. That's prime, prime um, depth. In the wintertime, those fish will come in. You can fish them inside the reef at about 45 feet of water. Um, patch reef fishing, you know, they'll come in in the wintertime. That, that area between the reef, the inner reef and the outer reef, you know, like, like Captain says, you can fish them in 100 feet of water also. It all depends what the current, what the current's doing, how successful you're going to be. 
Right, and Mark, what could you add? So when we down where Diego and I are fishing, you know, as you come off the, the shoals, off the reef, and in the wintertime, like Diego was, Diego was saying, if you've got a bait source there, like the ballyhoo and stuff, the bigger yellowtails will get in that shallow water. But then you've got what we call the gully. The gully goes down to about 100 foot. Now, you can fish that inside edge, and there'll be yellowtails and kingfish and stuff there, but then the reef comes back up to about 35 or 40, and then it starts dropping off. I'm sure more like we're, I don't know if you guys have up in Marathon that gully that we have to deal with. No, we don't, you know, unfortunately. So, you know, yeah. So some, are those fish on the inside of the gully or are they going to be on the outside of the reef? And if the current is really screaming, and like Diego says, we want an east or a west current. And a lot, most of the times in a lot of places, that tr current trickling west is going to be a great yellowtail current. But what we'll do is if the current's really screaming, now come back in, maybe try the inside edge of the gully. And I'll give you... Two points that I use uh, uh, religiously when we're going yellowtail fishing. One, uh, Simrad, in the past several months, have just come out with a sea map reveal. It's a high definition bathymetric chart that also shows a lot of the areas of Florida Keys. And I remember one area in particular, west of Key West, where yellowtail fishing. And I have my trail, I always see where I like to go. And we looked at this bottom, it's magnificent. And you're watching this map, and it said, This looks great right here with the current. So we anchored. And we were chumming, and nothing was really going on. So we moved to another part near the crown, and we anchored, and we started to get the fish. The other one is the Simrad machine that I'm using on my boat, is you study the bottom. I have the Chirp Enhanced Transducer, better target separation of fish and bottom, and you'll zoom that into the bottom to try to see if anything's laying real tight to the bottom there as well. So between those charts, and then looking at the sonar, I think that's two big keys right there and finding them. And then the rest falls into play, be it with the current and things like that. And the other thing that falls into play is our commercial break. So we're gonna take a break right now, but we're gonna come right back and get the nitty gritty of the chumming and some of the sullies involved in catching these fish. The topic is yellowtailing. We're at the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, filmed on location at the International Game Fish Association. We're coming right back after a word from our sponsors. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Simrad. Go with Simrad and go with confidence. Penn, let the battle begin. Sirius XM Marine, weather, fish mapping, and entertainment for anglers. Mercury Outboards, go boldly. Angle, portable fridge freezers and high performance coolers. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series filmed on location at the International Game Fish Association and brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. I'm here with my yellow toe panel, Diego Toyran, Captain Mark Schmidt, Captain Jimmy Gagliardini. We talked about boiling this down to what could be potentially a productive area. So now we're getting set. And Mark, I'll throw this to you. What I've always watched you do when we fish together is you put a block of chum in the bag and you'll start making laps around before you decide where you want to anchor on here to bring some of these fish up. Why don't you, you know, give me a little rhyme or reason, but I want to get deeper in the type of chum bag that you're using and the, and the amount or how large those mesh well, holes so are. Well, so first of all, you can catch, you know, you could, you could go out to the reef and, and use a small mesh chum bag and one little seven pound block of chum and catch yellowtails if the conditions are right. But the way it's going, and I'm sure Jimmy and Diego would back me up on this, everybody is chumming like crazy. And so to, in order to get going, we're using the Bubba Chum Bag. I'm using the Bubba Chum Bag, made locally there. You know, thick mesh, it's probably an inch, inch and a half. It can hold, you know, up to a 35-pound block of chum. And so if I'm serious, I'm going, I'm seriously yellowtailing, I'm putting you know, 25 to 35 pound block of chum in that big mesh bag and I'm setting down. So I'm, I'm usually, I, I, a, a long time ago, a couple commercial guys told me, hey, always, you know, drag around when, you know, have that chum bag out when you're dragging around. Now you don't want to go a half a mile, but I mean, if you think you've pretty much narrowed down the area, then that just kind of gets, it starts melting the chum and getting the flow going and everything. You're anchor, you anchor up then and you slide back on the anchor, you come tight. And the other thing is, don't be in any hurry to start fishing. Let that chum go to work. T talk to me about the chumming and how these fish in a lot of those places are conditioned. It's almost like fish farming. You know, nowadays, it, it, back in the days, as far as commercial fishing, we should take, a, and they still do it nowadays, you take um, oats with you. 
and you mix your, um, the night before you get a five pound bucket, and you put your block of chum in it, your oats, your menhaden oil, and you get that really primed up for the next morning. You could do that recreational, but it makes a mess. If you want to catch your bag limit of yellowtail, 10 per person, you know, you, don't, you really don't need it. You could, you could put a regular chum bag in there and get those fish up if the current's right. Is there a special time of year or a certain type of conditions or, or when could you target those real big flags when you get them up behind the boat solidly? Half marathon, the most consistent time for us to catch them is, I mean, you know, we catch them in the fall. We'll have times there in, in September, October. There's less people fishing. But again, when they're spawning in well, March, okay, March, March, April, May, oh yeah, we'll get them up real thick. In that deeper water, 70, 80, 90, even 100 feet. And, uh, and you have to outsmart those fish. They're, they, they do it for a living. Mm -hmm. they, they see hooks in line all the time. I, I do the oats and, and chum mix in a bucket every time uh, that I'm going to do it. The night before, I thaw out a block of chum. And, you know, I, I get the fish fired up into that chum because they're, they're looking for that line, that line and a hook, and they're looking for that hardware in there. So I'll throw out a handful of that and see how eager, when I get them up behind a boat to where you can see them, just, just watch how they respond to that, that cloud of oats and chum and see how eager they are to feed and let them get into that and then throw another cloud in there and throw another cloud in just, just a handful. And just, if you can get them close enough to where you can see them, watch the fish and see how they respond to it each time. If they're waiting for it, letting it sink back, wait, throw some more and wait till they're actually charging into it. And then, I'll, then that's when I'll put a piece of bait in there on a small hook and feed it back there. And now when you feed it back there, would you also throw another cloud burst in there too? Always. And have that go back with the cloud burst when they come in and condition I, I want it? the bait that I'm throwing in the water, I want it in the middle of that cloud. So when they get into a frenzy and they start competing for that food, they drop their guard a little bit and they'll eat that one with a hook. Gotcha. You want it to disguise the line. You want it to hide in that chum and okay. that cloud from the oats. And I want to take this one here as far as, uh, you know, the better baits. People use silver sides back there, thin pieces of, you know, ballyhoo after you section a ballyhoo. And one of my all-time best, you know, if we catch bonita from a previous trip, I'll put it in the freezer and take that out and use little slivers bonita. Stays on a tiny hook extremely well, and you catch a lot of good fish with that as, uh, as well. Now, Mark, real quickly, we've got about uh, 30 seconds left, and we'll continue this in the next break. But you do a lot of drifting back small jigs with these yellow tail. You, like Jimmy was saying, you can, you can go hooks, you know, and, and you can always put a split shot on a hook and do that. But there's a variety of yellow tail jigs and they go from on the large size, such as these, you know, and then you've got the small size, which is just a, a little press of lead. But again, you're trying to figure out the current, where the fish are eating, if they're eating closer, how deep, what, what the current is. And then you're trying to match. You want it to match that chum that's drifting back. The same flow rate. Same flow rate. That's and, where you come into different where, weights, that's keeping that in. chumming sphere. Or any weight back. at all. So, and the other thing is hiding the, the like the bonita. Sometimes you got to cut that skin off and just hide the hook in the meat. It just depends upon how squirrely they're acting that day. Exactly. We're going to take a quick break and we we'll come back and uh, get into some more details on catching yellowtail snapper. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series on the Florida Keys Yellow Talent. We'll be right back. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Rapala, your best shot at a world record. Suffix, always use the best line. VMC, your expert in hooks. Williamson Lures for the Pelagic Playground. Starbright, blending technology with performance since 1973. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series filmed on location at the International Game Fish Association. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Mark, I'm going to pick back up with you. We talked about drifting small jigs back. You made a very good point based on the weight jig to stay within that chum sphere as it's going down. Okay, do you tip the jigs with any particular type of bait, and what would that be for the most part? Well, as you mentioned earlier, that there's, there's several baits you can use from uh, ballyhoo, you know, strips of ballyhoo, to silver sides, to glass minnows. Um, with the glass minnows, the silver sides are a bigger bait, so you usually only need one of those. The glass minnows, you want to put two or three. We usually string them through the eye and then maybe hook into the body. But the toughest bait, in, in my opinion, and I, I think these guys will probably back me up, it's a piece of bonita. I mean, that thing, you can get multiple hits on it. The skin 
um, very tough. You can, you can, it lasts a long time. But sometimes those fish are so wary that you've even got to cut that skin off and bury the hook or bury the jig into the piece of that, the red piece of dark meat that you've got. I'm going to talk about leaders. Then I'm going to probably see if I could ignite some kind of a debate among you three here. But scaling down, the Florida Keys Yellowtails, they had their PhDs. They're, they're, they have the doctorate in, in, you know, being hard to fool. They've seen every single thing. And whereas you could go to the Bahamas with 20 pound test leader and catch all the big tails you want over here, 20 pound test, you're not going to get a strike. Many cases, it's scaling down to 10 pound fluorocarbon. And again, how do you get around that is you go with, or I like to use a number one VMC circle hook, very tiny circle hook with a very light leader. If you get a big tail, the circle hook, and it's set right, the eye will be on the outside of the fish's jaw. It's not going to be like if you use a tiny J hook where it ingests it and the teeth just start sawing across that light leader. Because you got to remember, a bigger tail is going to try to go down and you want to try to horse it to the boat to get it away from the predators out there too. So there's a trick with the light leader circle combination to get the bites. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. Stay cool and protected while fishing. Calcutta Outdoors, hard working outdoor gear. JL Audio, ahead of the curve. ACR, building survival products since 1956. Florida Keys and Key West. Visit flakeys.com. George will be right back. Welcome back to the final installment of the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. But now, Diego, this is going to come to you. You're going to start this one off. You talk to the old yellow tail experts. Don't bring braid on a boat. Even though if we use braid, we'll run long fluorocarbon leaders. They say monofilament all the way. And then you talk to people that like braid, but a long top shot of mono or fluorocarbon. What's your take on that? I like braid. You know, in today's world, I like braid. And, and back in the days, you can talk me into braids. Mm -hmm. um, and it was all mono. That's what I tie to my braid now, 20 pound test fluorocarbon. So that's what you're doing. So, so you're going, with, with braid and a 20 pound fluorocarbon on the tails. That's your leader. Yes, that's my leader. That's Whoa, my now, leader. Oh, so how, now, what are the secrets of getting bit with such a heavy leader? Well, believe it or not, 20 is not that, that big. If the sharks are there, I'll go to 25. I'll never go past 25. Now, if they're being, they're being tough, I'll drop down to 15. And, you know, usually I don't go to 10 because you, you, know, you get those big yellow tails down, down in, the, in the lower keys. You can't stop them. It's real hard. If the sharks are there, you ain't going to get them. Are you just freelining a hook with the bait in a chum slick? Are you sending baits to the bottom? What, what's your go-to tactic? Well, I'm going, I'm going to try to bring those fish up. Okay. I'm going to try to bring them fish up, and then I'm going to, if they come up, you can get away with not using a sinker at all. That's the best way to do it. But usually you have to use a small split shot. All these yellow tail magics, they're nice and light. And these will get you down the water column just enough lightly where you don't sink that much. Now, if you need to get way down, then you go with a bigger split shot. It's just, it's just a matter of, of, of presenting that, that bait as naturally as possible. Jimmy, again, going back to the bait uh, braid, mainline versus mono, or does not make a difference these days? I don't use braid. There you I don't so, use braid. The trouble is it's communist. <laughs> <laughs> it, let's just say you're feeding that bait back, and it gets eaten off by... You know, some sort of trash fish, let's say a file fish or something like that. Then you just have that, that bare hook, the fluorocarbon leader, pass right through the school of fish that are kind of skittish already because they, they know what's going on down there. Now that fluorocarbon passes through, now that braid passes through, they see every bit of it. A lot of times they disappear. Maybe in the lower keys, the fish aren't as... As, as wary as, as the ones off a of marathon, but the, the, ones, the ones where I live, if they see anything that resembles braid, the whole school's gone. And I try to chum them up as close to the boat as possible. And what are you using? Are you using 12 mono? What, what, what's your leader look like or what? I use, I use 15, anywhere from 10 to 15, depending on the size of the fish, how close they are to the boat, and how, how, how aggressive the predators are. If there's a lot of predators, I'll try to use as heavy line as I can get away with. Gotcha. Uh, a lot of times for us, it's 15. A lot of, we, can't, we rarely get them to eat 20 pound test. What about putting down, say, a knocker rig with a live pilcher, changing it up, maybe casting that knocker rig back into that chum slick? Doable? 
Well, yeah, for, for probably something other than yellowtails, you know, <laughs> you know, like the mangrove or mutton snappers, you know. But so uh, let me let me go back real quick because I use braid for everything. He, he wants I love. more. He wants more. Uh, here we go. We got thirty seconds to win this battle, so I, I let's love, hear it. I love braid except for yellowtail. I do not yellowtail with braid. Everything else I use it for. Even my trolling rigs, I'll put a top shot of mono. But I agree with Jimmy that the that the the braid and and you know we do we start I start I should talk for me. I can't talk for them. That you know with twelve or fifteen. But if I can upgrade to a 20 pound fluoro, which a lot of times you can, I will use it. Because again, we talked about the predators and all that. But 12 or 15 is mono is my goal to go to. And then make fluoro if that's not working. And the sink rates are different with the mono versus the, uh, the braid line too. So we're gonna leave this conversation on you know, an agitated note, and everyone's aggravated <laughs> over this battle. But I want to thank you for the tips on Yellowtail and the fabulous Florida Keys, Captain Jimmy Gagliardini, Captain Mark Schmidt, and Captain Diego Toyran. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, filmed on location at the International Game Fish Association. Well, there you have it. This week's Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Now, adhering to Saltwater Sportsman Seminar Series tradition, you still have chances to win door price drawings. Simply go to nationalseminarseries.com, log on to the door prize page, just give us your name, phone number, and an email address, and at the conclusion of the airing of the series in December, we will draw for a number of excellent door prizes. Get right to it. We'll see you on the next episode of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series.